All right. Uh, so again, I'm Ruben Strayer. I'm an emergency doctor. I live and work uh, in Brooklyn at Maimonides Medical Center. And I, I tweeted at EM Updates. I blog at emupdates.com. And we're going to talk about how to use ketamine for analgesia this afternoon. Um, if any of you guys have a comment or question in the middle, feel free to shout it out or raise your hand. Unlike yesterday's talk, for those of you who saw it when I was trying to cram 60 minutes of of stuff into 45 minutes. This is a much more focused um, talk, so uh, we'll be able to finish in plenty of time. And um, feel free to interrupt me if uh, you have questions or comments. So just for those of you who are coming in, if you're hoping to see a talk on women in medicine, that talk uh, is not going to be given by me. Um, it's going to be given by Jen Rapencheck in Salon 2. We're going to talk about ketamine. So when I started talking about ketamine as an analgesic a long time ago now, uh, it was cutting edge and sexy and exciting, and it's just not that any of those things anymore. There is so much literature attesting to the efficacy of ketamine as an analgesic, both in the emergency department and in other areas, uh, as monotherapy and combined with other drugs, that I'm just going to take it as a given. I'm going to start from the premise that ketamine is safe and effective for analgesia. If any of you want evidence to support that assertion, uh, I have mountains of papers. Um, all of the papers that you see listed here are emergency department relevant, um, either in the ED or in pre-hospital. Feel free to contact me and I'll be able to send you as much information, literature on this as you can shake a stick at. So the question I think in 2018 is not, is ketamine safe and effective, or even should I be using ketamine for analgesia, because you should. The question is how, how and uh, exactly what's the best way to, to use ketamine for analgesia. So ketamine is among the most effective analgesics for severe pain of any etiology. It's garnered a lot of attention uh, in recent years as an opioid alternative in folks who have chronic pain and opioid misuse, as we discussed yesterday, those are overlapping problems. Uh, but ketamine is also great as an alternative to opioids, not necessarily for folks who you think are going to be harmed by opioids, but there are a lot of people who uh, don't tolerate opioids very well. I'm sure all of you guys have seen patients who get IV morphine and become really, really nauseated or have a lot of histaminergic um, side effects. And in those cases, especially if they have severe pain, that can limit the amount of um, conventional opioids that you, that you give, and ketamine is a great arrow to have in your quiver for, for, those, for those cases. We're going to start with the ketamine brain continuum. You're going to use ketamine more effectively for all of its indications if you understand how ketamine works across its dose-response curve, uh, which is very different uh, than other medications. It doesn't have a linear dose-response curve where you give more and it just does more. Ketamine doesn't work that way. So we're going to talk about the ketamine brain continuum, which will, I think will inform your uh, capacity to, to, to use ketamine, not just for analgesia, but for all of its ever-expanding um, indication, indications. So there's four phases of effect in the ketamine brain continuum. Analgesia, recreational, partially dissociated, and fully dissociated. The analgesic plane is what we're focused on today. So in very small doses, ketamine delivers powerful analgesia with minimal effects on perception, emotion, hemodynamics. As you, as you push the dose higher, you transition into what I call the recreational phase, where patients will become increasingly well analgesed, but they will start to get stoned. Um, they'll become intoxicated, and they'll start to seem like they're intoxicated. Some of these folks will begin to hallucinate a little bit. They'll, they'll say things like, uh, the room feels funny, I feel dizzy, or this is really cool. You know, stuff that you would expect someone who's intoxicated to be, the, that's how they're going to behave. But folks who are in the recreational plane of the ketamine brain continuum, they are perfectly cognizant of their situation. They know exactly what's going on. They're conversant. They're often walking around. And many of them are enjoying the experience. In fact, 
ketamine, as many of you know, is used recreationally for this purpose. So that's the recreational phase. But as you push the dose higher, you push the patient into what I call partial dissociation. Partial dissociation is a state where enough synapses are still connected so that the patient is conscious and aware, but not enough synapses are connected so that they feel connected, the patient feels connected to their bodies and reality. Partial dissociation is a state where folks can feel completely disconnected from themselves. They can feel like they're floating above their bodies. They can lose their ability to speak or see or hear. These capabilities can come in and out. Most people will do fine in partial dissociation, but some people who are partially dissociated will find the experience of being completely disconnected from their bodies and reality terrifying. This is where psychiatric, severe psychiatric distress occurs, and the so-called emergence phenomenon that you see with ketamine, or that's often described in ketamine, it's called emergence phenomena because you usually see it after a dissociative dose as the ketamine is wearing off. You have to pass back through these other phases of the continuum. And that's when we see, uh, most often, these, the partial dissoci partially dissociated patient who is freaking out. Some of you have seen this in practice, uh, a severe psychiatric distress from ketamine, and you all know that this is not something that you want to be a part of. So partial dissociation is where you want your patient not to be. As I'll discuss, that's not really a huge concern when you use it in analgesic dosing. And then there's full dissociation. So full dissociation, which is one milligram, greater than one milligram per kilogram IV or four milligrams per kilogram IM, uh, renders the patient completely isolated from all external stimuli. The fully dissociated patient is awake, breathing, has uh, preserved cardiorespiratory tone, but is unconscious. And this is where we want patients who are getting very painful procedures, so as an agent for procedural sedation, and for a variety of other indications, which I'll list in a second. Uh, the fully dissociated uh, patient who is not intubated requires a procedural sedation setup, which means that you have to have an airway-capable provider at the bedside and all of the equipment you need to manage airway breathing and circulation, because although ketamine does preserve cardiorespiratory tone, uh, patients who are fully dissociated can develop hypoventilation and apnea from a variety of mechanisms. In, in the partially dissociated state, is it better to give more ketamine or something else? Or? It's a fantastic question. So he asks, in the partially dissociated state, what do you do about that? Do you uh, give more ketamine or do you back off? And that depends on what you're trying to achieve. So if you're trying to achieve full dissociation, you give, let's say, a dose. You see this, I used to see this all the time. I don't see it as much anymore. We're doing procedural sedation. Someone thinks it's a good idea. Instead of giving one milligram per kilogram IV, they give 0.5 milligrams per kilogram IV. The purpose is to do procedural sedation. We're all set up. We got everything. We're going to reduce a fracture or do whatever we're going to do. So you give 0.5 mix per kilogram, and the patient starts to lose their shit. They start screaming and going absolutely bonkers. The problem there is that not enough ketamine has been given. You, in that case, you want to push the patient into full dissociation because that's where you're trying to get. You're trying to get to full dissociation, so the answer there is more ketamine. If your goal is not dissociation but analgesia and you accidentally push the patient into partial dissociation, which is hard to do, as I'm going to discuss in two seconds, then you want to back off. You want to treat their psychiatric distress and let the ketamine wear off so they'll come back down to the analgesic plane, which is what, where you're trying to go. Does that make sense? Sort of? Yep, some people actually don't dissociate with one mg per kg. So if the patient is freaking out, that means they're not dissociated. A dissociated person is unconscious. So give another mg per kg. So the psychoperceptual effects are what happens in the first sort of three phases. And you get progressive psychoperceptual dysfunction, if you want to look at it that way starting with analgesia, where you have very little psychoperceptual effects, then moving through the recreational phase, where you get more psychoperceptual effects, and then in partial dissociation, where you have very prominent, often distressing psychoperceptual effects. Once you get to the plane of dissociation, those psychoperceptual effects are no longer relevant because the patient is unconscious. Some providers are concerned about using ketamine for analgesia because they're worried about 
producing severe psychiatric distress, the kind that you see as an emergence phenomenon after the patient has been dissociated. And those folks who have been present for these terrible emergence phenomena with severe psychiatric distress don't want to have anything to do with ketamine for analgesia for that reason. But you don't need to be concerned about that. And the reason is because you have a buffer in between the analgesic range and the partially dissociated range where people freak out. You have the recreational range. So if, you're what, you're if what you're trying to achieve is analgesia, then you give a small dose, and if you find that the person, the patient, is starting to complain about psychoperceptual effects, oh, the room is getting weird, oh, my hand is throbbing, oh, my foot just disappeared, that's your cue that you've pushed the patient into the recreational range, and you need to back off, you need to stop giving more. You are very unlikely to uh, push someone using the appropriate analgesic dose into partial dissociation where people feel completely disconnected, can't communicate properly, and start freaking out. People who are in the recreational range can be talked down. Uh, they can, you can manage them usually very easily. It's not a big deal. They know what's going on. If you give very low dose ketamine, you're gonna be in the analgesic range. And if you give very high dose ketamine, you're gonna be in dissociation. But in between low and high, in between low and high dose, you don't necessarily know what you're gonna get. It, depend, it depends on individual patient factors and what other drugs are on board and the alignment of the stars in the sky. So you wanna make sure that you're giving either low enough to be in the analgesic range where psychoperceptual effects are minimized or high enough so that you push the patient into dissociation so the patient is unconscious. And so just to be clear, to hammer this point home, because this is where most of the questions come from. I get a ton of questions about this stuff. Analgesia dose, very low dose, and I'm gonna talk about dosing in just a second, is good for analgesia. That's really the one indication for very low dose, analgesic dose ketamine. Everything else that you use ketamine for, procedural sedation, uh, as an induction agent for RSI, for post-intubation sedation, uh, if you're gonna tranquilize an uncontrollably violent patient, if you're gonna use it as a therapy for asthma, all of those indications, for all of, of those indications, you wanna use dissociative dose ketamine, again, greater than one to two milligrams per kilogram IV, or four to six milligrams per kilogram IM. Okay, so how do you use ketamine for analgesia? K-analgesia, canalgesia. There are a few different ways to do it. You can push ketamine as a bolus. The dose is about 0.25 milligrams per kilogram, so in a normal-sized adult, we're looking at 10, 20, 30 milligrams pushed as a bolus. 10 milligram push of ketamine is gonna have minimal psych uh, psychoperceptual effects. It's not gonna, you're not gonna run into any trouble with psychoperceptual effects if you give 10 of ketamine to a normal sized adult, but you may not have adequate analgesia. You often will have an adequate analgesia, but not always. If you push 30, you're going to get adequate analgesia for sure. The patient is gonna be very well analgesed, but many folks who get a 30 milligram push of ketamine are gonna be pushed into uh, the recreational range, and so you'll start seeing those psychoperceptual effects very prominently at 30 milligrams. So that's the dose as a, as a push. Most of the time, though, if you, if you push ketamine and you end up in the recreational range, the patient is okay, you can talk to them, they're usually not bothered by, by it. If they are bothered by it, it doesn't last very long. When you push ketamine, there's two disadvantages, two major disadvantages. Number one, it doesn't last very long, 10, 15, 20, 25 minutes at most. And then number two, by pushing ketamine, you accentuate its psychoperceptual effects, which is what you don't want uh, with ketamine. We want the analgesia, we don't want the psychoperceptual effects. And when you push it, you accentuate those psychoperceptual effects. So you do better to infuse it. And when I made these slides um, and uh, started talking about this years ago, we sort of knew this anecdotally, and now we have data actually comes from my institution. Sergey Motov has, has studied this, and now we have science to back up what those of us who use a lot of ketamine have known all along, which is that you can do better by prolonging the uh, infusion of ketamine over 10, 15, 20, even 30 minutes. And so most folks will do much better with an infusion. And the standard infusion is 20 milligrams over 10 minutes. That's what I've been using for about a decade now and that works uh, very well in most cases. But the best approach for most patients with severe acute pain is a loading dose infusion followed by a continuous drip. You may be thinking, I don't wanna write for a loading dose infusion followed by a continuous drip. That's too complicated, it's not complicated, you're being difficult, you're afraid of change. 
once you and your nurses get used to doing a loading dose and a drip of ketamine, you will not want to go back to the PRN dosing of opioids, which in a busy department always leaves patients uncovered because you're not circling back, circling back to them in time to redose them with morphine or fentanyl or whatever you're using. The drip works great. And what I recommend is 20 milligrams in 10 minutes, that's your load, and then 20 milligrams per hour titrated to effect. If uh, the patient is inadequately analgesed, you turn it up. If the psychoperceptual effects are too prominent, you turn it down. Your goal is to have a well-analgesed patient with a normal mental status or a nearly normal mental status, and most of the time, you can get there. You might have to fiddle with it a little bit, but you can get there most of the time. There are so many administrative barriers and so many departments um, when trying to implement ketamine for analgesia. There are still lots of departments where you can't use ketamine for procedural sedation, which is criminal. Uh, they're pushing emergency doctors to use fentanyl versed, which has been used for decades, but is incontrovertibly more dangerous than using ketamine for procedural sedation. And a lot of uh, administrations don't s see the difference between ketamine for analgesia and ketamine for PSA. And there's all sorts of administrative barriers that you can run into uh, including grouping analgesic dose ketamine with procedural sedation dose ketamine, which is similar to grouping five milligrams of morphine with 50 milligrams of morphine. It doesn't make any sense. Analgesic dose ketamine does not require monitoring. Uh, you do not see any perturbations with the ABCs when you keep ketamine in an analgesic range. And now uh, ASEP has confirmed this, supported this with a just, just issued policy statement where um, they stipulate that for analgesic dosing and analgesic dosing, monitoring is not necessary. The way that I've had success with this in um, co convincing my nurses is I use the morphine analogy. We routinely give five milligrams of morphine to people off monitor, but we would never give 50 milligrams of morphine to someone off monitor. It's the same with ketamine, so you can give 10 or 20 milligrams of ketamine, no problem to someone off monitor, but if you want to give 200 milligrams of, of ketamine, then that person needs to be uh, monitored with a procedural sedation setup. So adjuncts, there are a variety of adjuncts that you can use um, as needed for ketamine, with ketamine when you're using it as an analgesic agent. So uh, what's the role for opioids when you're using uh, ketamine? You don't need opioids, Ketamine will take care of whatever pain ails you. It's a very powerful analgesic. But I often, in severe acute pain in opioid-naive patients, I'll often give a dose or two of morphine because my nurses are so used to it and we can do that so quickly. And then if that doesn't work, that's when I get started with uh, ketamine in, in that group. And that's sort of my prompt that it's time for ketamine when two doses of morphine don't work. That's sort of my own algorithm. Uh, so you definitely can start with opioids if you want, but you don't need to. You can move right to ketamine, especially if there are good reasons to avoid opioids. Some patients get pushed into recreational range or possibly, I've never seen it, but possibly become partially dissociated and really start freaking out uh, with analgesic dose ketamine. I've, given, I've used ketamine uh, over a thousand times in my career, most of them still for procedural sedation and other dissociative um, uh, uses, and all of the, the severe uh, psychiatric distress I've seen with ketamine is on emergence from uh, dissociative dose ketamine. I have never seen severe psychiatric distress with analgesic dose ketamine, but I have seen some folks get a little bit uncomfortable. They still are talking and walking around. They're just like, oh, I don't like this. And so there is a role for uh, anxiolysis, and the conventional sedatives work exceedingly well in this context. You can use a little, a droperidol was magic. We don't have droperidol any, anymore in this country. Um, haloperidol works fine, although it's a little bit uh, too long uh, onset for my, for my tests. So I generally will use a little bit of midazolam or diazepam. Is there a question over here? So you're talking about after dissociative dose? Yes. So the question is uh, psychiatric distress on, on emergence, which is a different topic, but relevant. And uh, midazolam works fabulously well for that. I will tell you that when I'm dissociating with ketamine for procedural sedation, I now have a, a vial of, or a syringe full of propofol drawn up because propofol also treats the muscle rigidity that sometimes can be problematic and the hypertension, which almost never matters, but sometimes uh, might matter. So I have my syringe full of, of propofol drawn up and 
in the uh, uncommon circumstance that my patient starts developing significant psychiatric distress on emergence from dissociation, I'll dose an aliquot of um, propofol, 10, 20, 30 milligrams. How long does what last? The, the, the Psychiatric distress? Psychiatric. Yeah, so it depends on the patient, but what I would tell you is don't allow any um, psychiatric distress on emergent. It can be really terrifying if you've read enough of these anecdotes, and I've read many of them. This is not a state you want to be in. So you should be vigilantly, again, this is not analgesic dose ketamine. When you're emerging from dissoci dissociation, when your patient is emerging from dissociation, you want to be vigilantly watching that patient, to, looking for signs of psychiatric stress, and when you see them, you should treat it. You shouldn't wait for it to resolve. You should treat it. Uh, nausea is common with dissociative dose ketamine or after dissociative dose ketamine. I haven't seen it in analgesic dose ketamine, but it's uh, reported, and ondansetron works great in post-dissociation post-procedural sedation, nausea from ketamine, and I expect it would work similarly well in this context if it ever came up. The, the larger point is to use these agents as needed. You don't need to make them part of your protocol for ketamine analgesia. Use, the, uh, use these adjuncts as needed f for when these symptoms come up. I'm gonna move into some um, cases. When's my, what's my time, when, when am I finished? Five minutes, okay. So I have a few cases to discuss. I'm gonna run through them really quickly. Uh, the first is severe acute pain. Uh, this was a patient who, a young woman who got into a terrible motorcycle accident and had s severe acute pain. She got, uh, she was opioid naive. She got eight milligrams right off the bat. And then 15 minutes later, it wasn't helping enough. So I gave another eight milligrams. So within the first 20 minutes, she had 16 milligrams of morphine. This is a uh, normal sized, uh, opioid naive young woman. And she was not in agony anymore, but um, was not comfortable. So that was my cue, uh, and I started a ketamine uh, infusion and continuous drip, 20 milligrams over 10 minutes, then 20 milligrams per hour. And within about 30 minutes, she was basically pain-free with a normal mental status. She stayed in the emergency department for hours and hours, uh, my whole shift and beyond. Uh, waiting to go upstairs to the operating room and was perfectly comfortable with a normal mental status throughout. Um, so that's severe acute pain, fabulous, fabulous, fabulous in trauma. Uh, the next severe acute pain case is a recovered opiate addict. Um, there's nobody who shouldn't get opioids more than a recovered addict. So this um, sober opioid addict um, uh, presented after a terrible grease burn. He had severe burns over both thighs, horrible, horribly painful, painful, and he begged me not to use opioids. So the first part is easy, ketamine 20 and 20. He was pain-free in 30 minutes. The problem is this guy's not being admitted, and I can't send him home on a ketamine drip. So what we did was we just sort of lathered him up with lidocaine, uh, topical lidocaine, and uh, gave him uh, a number of other non-opioid, non non-ketamine analgesics, and slowly, over a period of a couple hours, weaned off the ketamine drip. When the ketamine drip was off, his pain definitely returned. He was in a fair amount of pain when he was discharged, but it was manageable, and he was very happy uh, to go home with his level of pain, knowing it would get better in a day or two, and I think this is incontrovertibly um, vastly pre preferable to re-exposing this patient to opioids. Let me hold questions since I'm running out of time and I'll try to take anything at the end. We're almost done. Uh, this leads me to my chronic pain case, which is perhaps what most of you are interested in here. Um, this young woman that we used to see a lot in one of the places where I worked came in by ambulance screaming in pain. She's a chronic pain patient, and she often got um, intravenous hydromorphone, which is what she was requesting. Um, and that works, and that's certainly the easiest thing to do. Unfortunately, that perpetuates the problem of chronic pain and opioid addiction that had already ruined her life and was likely to kill her. So I didn't want to perpetuate that as we discussed yesterday. So what I did at that time and what I still do is I started with intramuscular droperidol. We don't have that anymore, but that's what I gave. Often these patients fall asleep, they wake up, they want to go home. In this case, she got a little better, but not adequately. So after about 30 minutes later, I started an IV. I gave her another five of droperidol, and I gave her 30 milligrams of ketamine over 30 minutes. 
she was a big person, um, but that's still a pretty hefty dose. And she got a little bit loopy, but because she had all this droperidol on board, she didn't mind it at all. She was very happily um, pain-free um, after the, uh, during and after the ketamine infusion. She fell asleep, she woke up, and she wanted to go home. I gave her some resources for opioid addiction, and, uh, and she left. We don't have droperidol anymore, so you can substitute Haldol. You have to double the dose. This is a separate talk um, about the use of Haldol and droperidol in pain. It doesn't really matter what the chronic pain syndrome is, what they all have in common. Uh, most, of, most of these folks have in common is daily opioid use, and I use a combination of haloperidol and ketamine for almost all of these folks, including patients with sickle cell pain. Sickle cell, sickle cell is a horrendous disease, life-limiting disease but uh, many folks uh, who have sickle cell pain, severe crisis of sickle cell pain, have been turned into opioid addicts by their physicians, well-meaning in general, well-meaning physicians, who have um, turned these patients into uh, opioid addicts, so now they have two problems. They have this terrible life-limiting disease and opioid addiction, and so I've been able to manage many of them effectively um, without, without opioids using this sort of uh, cocktail to say, to say a word about the, the combination of Haldol and ketamine, um, there's nothing about this in the literature, but if you start with haloperidol, which often works by itself for pain, if it doesn't work, you are very well set up for ketamine because the therapeutic window for analgesic dose ketamine is actually pretty narrow. With a drip, you can almost always get there, but for these chronic pain patients who you kind of want to move through the department, who are not being admitted for a bad trauma, you don't necessarily want to put them on a drip. And when you give the Haldol first, what happens is that you can dose the ketamine higher because you've expanded your therapeutic window. Because even if those patients develop some recreational symptoms, some psycho psychoperceptual symptoms, the haloperidol doesn't prevent them from developing psychoperceptual symptoms, the psychoperceptual effects. But because the halo haloperidol is an antipsychotic and a sedative, these patients are not bothered by the psychoperceptual effects. So when you give Haldol first, in, for example, a chronic pain patient, you expand the therapeutic window for ketamine. I'm gonna close with uh, an unforgettable case, a uh, 74-year-old um, lady who was being treated for uh, pancreatic cancer uh, at home with her husband on hospice, and she developed hematemesis at home. And the husband called 911 with great reluctance, um, only because he just couldn't handle um, watching his wife of 50 years die at home in a pool of blood. And she um, looked like she was at the end of her life, uh, as you can imagine, and she had a totally normal mental status, and she knew that she was approaching the end of her life. And we talked about endoscopy, and she said, absolutely not, we are ready for this to be over. It still gives me chills to think about this case. So the husband was crying, the nurse was crying, it was a terrible scene, and I felt pretty helpless um, until she said, doctor, can I have something for pain? I am in so much pain. And then, I'm so glad that she said that because then I had something that I could do. And she, of course, was on massive doses of opioids at home. She had fentanyl patches and she was on huge doses of MS content and so forth and so on. And so ketamine it was, 20 and 20. And I, I went back to see her a few minutes later and she was kind of hazy and not really talking much. And I was like, okay, this is too much ketamine. And so I lowered the dose to 10. And then I went back to check on her a little bit later, and she was crying. And I said, oh, shit, she's, um, she has psychoperceptual distress. But no, her, her mentation had returned to normal. And um, she was crying because, she, as she said, that this was the first time in months that she had been pain-free. She died the next day. So uh, in summary, as you move up the dose curve, um, ketamine starts as a pure analgesic, then produces changes in perception, hallucinations, uh, and derealization de and partial dissociation uh, before you reach the threshold of dissociation where the patient is uh, unconscious and unaware. So um, utilize the ketamine brain continuum to use ketamine effectively. You can push 10, 20, 30 milligrams um, and of, of ketamine in a normal-sized adult, but this accentuates ketamine's psychoperceptual effects, which is not what you want, you do better to infuse it over 10 or 20 minutes, uh, 20 milligrams uh, in 10 minutes, and then a drip 20 milligrams per hour is the best way to uh, manage most patients with severe acute pain who are gonna be in the department for a while. All right, do we have time for a couple questions?